All right, well, why don't we get started? <clears throat> We've got about a little over 40, just over 40 people with us this evening. So I'd just like to formally welcome you all. My name is Derek Sherman. <clears throat> I uh, teach computer science at Kelvin University. And uh, I, uh, I'm one of the, well, I'm the webmaster for the uh, West Michigan chapter of the ASA. And I'm grateful to Dana, who's joining us from ASA headquarters, who is our Zoom master for tonight. So thank you very much to Dana for helping us set this up. Um, and before we go any further, I just wanted to lead us all in a quick prayer for the evening, and then I will hand it off to Ralph. So um, wherever you are, uh, I'd just like to welcome you to join me for a moment in a, in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to meet, for the technology that enables us from vast and many varied places to come together to listen to, uh, to Roger. We thank you for the opportunity to learn more about his work. Thank you for Christians that you have placed in all kinds of different uh, endeavors and areas of study. And we thank you for his work too. We pray for a blessing on this evening. Help us to delight in the pictures and the science that's coming back. And, uh, and the things that we're learning about the whole cosmos. We thank you that the heavens declare your glory and that we can, that you've given us the faculties and the senses to uh, appreciate that and to study that. Bless us this evening and bless uh, the beginning of this new chapter. We pray that it may be the beginning of many fruitful conversations about faith and science uh, in the West Michigan area. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, I'd like to pass it over to Ralph, who is the president of the West Michigan ASA chapter, and uh, he will introduce the ASA and our speaker. So over to you, Ralph. I'm president by default. I can explain that later. I just wanted to thank uh, our sponsors, our joint sponsors for this uh, effort. Uh, this is a, this is a official West Michigan chapter meeting of the ASA, but at Calvin we have this Christian Perspectives in Science seminar that Lauren Harzma has run for many, many years, for which uh, many of us are very, very grateful. And then we have a new Student Science and Religion Forum that Ryan Beebe is that serves as the faculty advisor. And I think we have some members of uh, SCARF here tonight. And I also, like Derek, I wanted to thank Dana for overseeing this and make, basically keeping us safe, keeping me safe at any rate. The plan uh, that we have we're tentatively following is this arrival time from 7 to 7.30, and then uh, the 7.30 to 7.40 is this current welcome. We'll turn it over to Roger. Then we'll have a question and answer session for about 10 minutes or so. And um, we encourage you to re record your, your uh, questions on the chat room. And uh, following that, we will have a, a sort of uh, simulated hallway conversations uh, episode where we will break out into groups of five. Derek is going to sort of arbitrarily mix and match us, and we'll get to talk to people that we don't know, get to meet new people, and I think maybe Roger will be part of one of those groups. And then somewhere around oh, 9 o'clock, pardon? Okay. Somewhere around 9 o'clock, we will conclude. And uh, we're not in a, in a rush to drive people out. We're not under any harsh deadline, but uh, that's our goal. Okay. Some of you don't know the ASA. We have a bunch of members of the ASA here, but we also have a bunch of non-members. Just so you know, it was founded in 1941 as an international network of Christians. We're mostly uh, Christians in the sciences, although there are ways to join the organization for others and, and serve as sort of an adjunct member. And we're interested in trying to figure out uh, just how and why uh, God's creative activity relates to what we find out in the natural sciences. We engage the faith and science dialogue along three primarily, primary vectors or platforms. One is discovery, ideas, and scholarship. That includes an annual meeting and also a journal that we publish four times a year, and now a new online journal that I'll mention in a minute. Uh, professional development and fellowship and networking. And of course, tonight's uh, episode is an example of that, just that, uh, networking opportunities. Okay. This is our journal, Perspectives on Science and Christian Faith. Uh, it comes out four times a year. 
uh, student members can join for free. We'll, I'll mention that in a minute again. Uh, if, but if you want to just take the online version of this journal and, um, it's a good journal. You can see the current issue is dealing with issues about transhumanism. And, uh, we often have theme topics. Okay. We also publish an online journal, God in Nature magazine. It comes out quarterly. And here we see, uh, the summer 2020 special issue on the COVID-19 pandemic with the joint editors, uh, Cy Gard on the left and Eco Albert on the right. And of course, Francis Collins, who's a member of the ASA in the middle. We do have 36 local chapters. You don't have to join a local chapter to be a member of the ASA, uh, but they are convenient and helpful for a lot of people. And uh, several of us felt it incumbent on ourselves to start a local chapter here. There, there was a West Michigan chapter back in the 1980s, but it was allowed to dry up. So hopefully we're just getting this effort going and it'll flourish and blossom. And uh, all these people are here tonight. Uh, Gail Ermer is professor of engineering at Calvin. She serves as secretary treasurer. Derek Sherman is our webmaster. Uh, Ryan Beebe from Calvin's biology department is our vice president and I'm president. And as I, said I'm just president by default. We actually need to have officers in hand before you can begin to form a local chapter. So it's, it's a bit of a catch-22. So the four of us kind of stepped up to the plate. We volunteered to be local officers, but I'm happy to yield my position to anyone that really wants it. So thanks. Uh, we have an annual meeting. This year, because of the coronavirus outbreak, it was shifted. So it will be the meeting that would have been held this year will occur next year at Point Loma Nazarene University in San Diego, California. There will be um, a list of major speakers. There will be breakout sessions. There will be field trips. There will be lots of social events. There will be worshiping. And um, it's, it's quite reasonable, although we have transportation issues from our part of the world, of course. For members, uh, you can be a full member for $85 a year. Those are people who have a bachelor's degree in science, who also assent to our statement of faith. You can also be an associate member if you don't have a degree in science and can still assent to our statement of faith. And here's uh, where I hope several people in the audience will find this interesting. Uh, as a student, you can join for free. Uh, the, that gives you sort of the basic membership, which uh, includes uh, online access to our journals and um, access to meetings and so forth. But if you want to kick in $20, you get the printed copy of the journal and you get voting rights and so forth. And we're authorized by the ASA to offer a promotional activity tonight, uh, a complimentary one-year free membership to the ASA through this uh, promotional code, ASA GIFT 2020. Well, I'd like to say a little bit about our speaker. Uh, some of us know Roger well, some of us not so well. Uh, Roger works for Los Alamos Na National Lab. Uh, before that, for many years, he was at Caltech. He got his BS degree from Wheaton College and his PhD from the University of Minnesota. He holds an honorary doctorate from the University of Toulouse and has an asteroid named after him. That's pretty cool. Roger, several years back, published this book, which we'll hear more about during the course of the talk, The Red Rover, Inside the History of Robotic Space Exploration, From Genesis to the Mars Rover Curiosity. And of course, now we know the Mars Perseverance Rover is en route to Mars. Should arrive there, I think, in February. Roger can correct me if I'm wrong. Early in 2020. And it looks like things are going well thus far. So, uh, and Roger puts very, 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 very fancy cameras on these rovers, which have remarkable sensing capabilities. And we'll hear a lot about that from Roger tonight. So uh, I turn the meeting over to Roger. And then uh, after his talk, of course, we will have a question and answer session. Derek will moderate that. And then we'll have the breakout sessions. 
And I thank you all once again for coming tonight and um, look forward to this talk now. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Ralph and Derek. And by the way, if we get cut off, uh, let's see, Derek, I put my uh, phone number in the uh, in an email, so hopefully that doesn't happen. Uh, so uh, I'm really privileged to be able to join all of uh, so many distinguished uh, people in the audience tonight. Uh, many of you are my heroes, actually, and uh, educating uh, Christians from uh, Christian colleges and other places and being a part of the ASA. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really uh, privileged tonight. So um, uh, since we're with a uh, intellectual Christian audience, I wanted to start out this talk uh, basically with a little bit more sort of background. Uh, much of my talk is about um, uh, Mars exploration, but uh, I did give a talk actually at another Christian, at a Christian college on uh, the search for life in the universe. So I'm going to mix a little bit of that in. And so to start with, let me see if my uh, slide advance will work. Here we go. Uh, so let's start with the question, what is our universe? And how does Mars and our exploration of Mars fit into that. Why are we doing this? So if we look back in time, I want to look not just in space, but in time and think about how rapidly we have actually learned about our universe in the recent, in recent years. So if we go way back in time to about 500 BC, then uh, we have this idea that the earth is flat, that it was surrounded by water. And uh, not only do we have that from the classical uh, records of that time, or at least shortly after that, but we have those things from the Bible as well. And so we have, uh, for example, this Psalm, which I can read if I can read my chat box. Whoops, I just maximized it. There we go. Uh, on the lower right, which says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, who spread out the earth upon the waters. And so you have this idea that that as part of creation, God created the earth or the land upon the waters. And that was the, his act of creation. We can also look at Genesis 1-1 in the left-hand side. And if, if uh, I'm sure some of you know some Hebrew, uh, uh, definitely more than I, but I understand that in Hebrew, the word uh, earth and the word land are the same word. And the same thing with heavens and the word sky. And so we have this verse, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, or the sky and the land. And so notice the ocean isn't mentioned there. Uh, it's mentioned more like the, the darkness was on the face of the deep. And so we have this idea that, that land was created, and we had this flat earth. And then we go on uh, a few, so let me get my slide advancing again. There we go. Um, and this is the first sort of record that we have that the, that the Earth was round, and it's a reconstruction of Ptolemy's map from 150 AD, uh, where they actually have latitude and longitudes. And you can see the Mediterranean sort of up on the left with Europe there, and then um, Arabia in the middle, and then India on the right. And so this first record that we really have around Earth. And so, of course, that is going to raise the question, what is on the other side of the Earth? And it was actually many centuries from this time until people started to figure out what was on the other side of the earth. In that meantime, there was a lot of speculation, just like we perhaps speculate what's beyond the reach of SETI or uh, many other things in our universe. And so I think it's really useful to actually think about these things and realize that humans have sort of questioned what's beyond the, uh, what we could actually see for a long time. So what's on the other side? Well, they called the they call the mythical people that would live on the other side of the earth, they call them antipodians, right? They're on the antipodes of whatever we have that we know of on the earth. And uh, so uh, most of the people who uh, uh, espoused this idea of a spherical earth did think that people might walk right side up on the other side of the earth, um, even though this whole idea of gravity was centuries later, to come centuries later. And uh, so then, of course, explorers of the 16th century finally discovered the Earth's backside and showed uh, as well that it was really round. And, uh, but anyway, this whole time in human history uh, that uh, people were speculating even just about the other side of the Earth. And so we can use that, those thoughts and that reason or, the, or that understanding of, of their reasoning 
to start thinking about how we are reasoning now towards the things that we don't know about. Uh, now here's a, a, one of the first maps from uh, this uh, era when uh, the new worlds have been discovered and so all seven continents are there. But if you look for Australia, it's hardly a continent there. So uh, anyway, going further along, now we can start in the 17th century to start to realize Earth is part of a solar system. So this was another uh, huge revolution in thought that there were not just around Earth, but that there were around planets, around our sun. And so once again, people started thinking about what would be the kind of creatures that would live on these other round planets that are orbiting our sun. And so there's a lot of speculation about that. And we'll get back to that in just a little bit. But first, just looking into our stellar neighborhood, um, uh, the par parallaxes were measured in the 20th century. And so you can see we have only 33 stars within about 12 and a half light years. But if we go back about 20 times as far, then we have uh, 250,000 stars. That's about the reach, uh, as I understand it, of SETI, uh, assuming sort of typical radio signal strengths like the Earth puts out now. And so there's, a, of course, a huge amount of the universe that's beyond that. And so that leaves a lot uh, that is not uh, being listened to or, or thought about that much. So we have 200 billion stars in our, in our Milky Way galaxy. And then uh, to make us look and feel really small, um, we have some 100 billion galaxies in uh, the known universe. And this is, well, the, the lines in this are, are, look, are, are actually indicating uh, modes of our directions of motion. And uh, so, um, do we really understand this universe yet? Uh, I would say no, not at all. And uh, so it's, uh, you know, the 21st century could be just as, uh, as, as interesting as the 20th in terms of all the discoveries that might be made. And uh, so uh, I'm, I'm really excited about that. So uh, just to think a little bit about Christian thought about this, uh, C.S. Lewis in his 1958 essay, Religion and Rocket, Rocketry speculates about life elsewhere in the universe. And uh, we also know from, uh, from some of his other works, his fiction works, that he was really delving into the question of if there are other worlds, did God visit them uh, with his son, perhaps, like uh, he did our world. And, uh, you know, I, th I think uh, his, uh, his fiction is so creative that it just leaves us really thinking about what God might be doing or have done with part of the rest of our, our, our universe that we just don't know about yet. And so that this leaves me really curious um, about the, the universe and about God. Um, but uh, thinking about poss the possibility of life elsewhere, uh, Frank Drake uh, at one of the first SETI meetings in 1961 uh, put up this uh, pencil, this equation. And so this is a, a number of factors that have to go into uh, sort of an estimate of the number of civilizations whose electromagnetic or radio emissions we could detect. And uh, the problem, of course, with this equation, it's been known for a long time, but the problem is that most of the factors are, are really highly uncertain. And uh, so that, uh, that, that leaves us with a lot of uncertainty on this whole thing, of course. Now, jumping ahead a lot in my talk, uh, so I'm, I'm, moving, I'm skipping a whole bunch, but Mars turns out to be within the habitable zone of our solar system. And so you can see that in the, in the image in the lower left. Um, habitable zones uh, can actually differ quite a lot depending on the amount of volatiles on a planet and various other things. Um, and in fact, if you think about, uh, if, you, if you know something about astrophysics, a main sequence star will start out with much lower luminosity. And uh, so it's, uh, it's well possible, as we actually just talked a little bit before the talk, that Venus might have been in the habitable zone early in our solar system's history. Um, so, but Mars is certainly there, and, and it's, uh, it's something we can explore. And just over the last 10 years, we've really understood that Mars was uh, quite habitable some time ago. And it had these lakes, rivers, and probably oceans, and may have been as habitable as Earth at that point in time. And so to look at uh, Frank Drake's equation uh, with, with Mars in view, uh, we're really looking at one of these highly uncertain factors when we look and try to understand if there was life on Mars. And that is a fraction of suitable planets on which life actually develops, or we can say is created, or, uh, or it has the potential to develop based on, on what God has done. So um, 
That's pretty cool. And so we're, we're trying to understand a, a lot more of our universe this way. Now, um, there's, uh, you could almost say that Mars is too close to Earth. In fact, right now, we're coming up on the close approach of Mars within the next several weeks to Earth. And if you go out late at night, you'll see Mars, uh, at the, which will be at the, its zenith right around midnight, uh, very bright. And, uh, and in, in fact, uh, almost, uh, almost visible as a small sphere to the human eye. And uh, so uh, it gets so close that at times there probably has been transport of, uh, of life, possibly from Earth to Mars at some times in the past. We know that because there's over 150 uh, Mars rocks that we have found on Earth. And I actually made, uh, made my PhD work studying one of these. Um, but you can imagine that if, this, if there's that many Mars rocks that have come to Earth, the, the reverse could have happened, and we could have uh, certainly seeded Mars with bacteria over time. Um, so why we don't find more life on Earth is a, you know, is a very interesting uh, question, both from a sort of uh, um, independent origin of life kind of idea, and then also from sending it there from Earth. Uh, now the question can come up, have we found life on Mars already? And it turns out that uh, in 1996, uh, uh, Dave McKay uh, authored a paper on carbonate structures that are found in one of these Martian meteorites that were supposedly resembling bacteria. I mean, on this, this uh, photomicrograph uh, from the SEM that you see on the left, you can see these little things that look like they might possibly be living organisms. Um, but it turns out that uh, the magnification is turned up too high on this microscope they're actually too small. They're almost a factor of 10, too small to be even RNA, which is the smallest building block of life on Earth, and, or at least terrestrial RNA. So um, uh, it doesn't seem like these are uh, evidence of life, but it sure, certainly caused quite a stir. So um, anyway, uh, during coming back kind of to our historical tour that we had earlier, uh, starting about 150 years ago, we had first, um, uh, uh, the Italian um, uh, Giovanni Schiaparelli, and then later uh, Percival Lowell in the U.S., really uh, uh, trying to popularize this idea that there were canals on Mars. Uh, I spent part of my childhood uh, looking through Mars at a telescope, uh, looking at Mars through a telescope, and uh, with atmospheric turbulence, you actually start to see things that look like these lines uh, on the Mars globe. You look at it during close approach. But um, in fact, uh, they're uh, optical illusions. Um, and, uh, but their idea was that this was, uh, they knew that the atmosphere of Mars was thin, that it was too far from the sun to have a lot of energy. And so they were suggesting that this was a dying civilization that was uh, trying to keep water uh, going on this, this uh, cold planet. Um, and it wasn't until the 1960s that they were really completely proven wrong, uh, even though uh, telescopic observations with uh, photographs show that this wasn't really the case in the earlier 20th century. But, uh, okay, so by the, uh, oh, yeah, and I forgot that Edgar Rice Burroughs certainly capitalized on this. And, and the one really great thing we got out of this is, is science fiction. So that whole genre popped up after, uh, after Schiaparelli and, uh, uh, and, and, and his Flagstaff colleagues. So um, that was kind of fun for many of us. Uh, anyway, in the 1960s, we started out with the flyby missions uh, with Mariner 4, and it turns out that these flyby missions uh, only generally could see one side of Mars because they flew by so rapidly, and we were a bit unlucky because they, were look they saw mostly heavily cratered regions of Mars, and it wasn't uh, really until the orbiter uh, arrived, uh, Mariner 9, in 1971, that we started to see this really great evidence that there had been water on Mars. And yet because of the thin atmosphere and the, the uh, sort of uh, modeling work that was done uh, looking to the past on Mars, it was, the, it was argued that this could not be water that had created these canyons. And I remember even at scientific conferences in the 1980s, 90s, that that was the case. Um, now in 1976, we had two uh, twin landers that were the first to land on Mars, the Viking landers. And uh, uh, in fact, one of the really interesting anecdotes is that President Gerald Ford called up uh, um, uh, uh, Mr. Martin, the, uh, the project manager of this uh, project at JPL, 
And, uh, and he asked uh, Martin, he said, would you see anything if it moved on the surface of Mars? Suggesting we were still looking for a mouse or something else that might possibly be living on this barren surface. Um, but uh, there were uh, also organic uh, tests on the Viking landers. There was a couple that came up a bit equivocal, but, um, but most really uh, they showed that there was really uh, no organics that were observed with these, uh, with these experiments. And some of the equivocal results were based on some chemistry that was not really known at that time. And so the whole idea that there was life on Mars kind of went away and, uh, and it lay dormant for a number of years and uh, until the era of the Mars rovers. And that started with the Sojourner rover in 1997, <laughs> this tiny little rover. And that was followed by the twin uh, Spirit and Opportunity rovers in 2004. They had only a, a 11 kilograms of payload instruments. And then in 2012, we got the Curiosity rover on the surface of Mars. And this had something like 160 pounds of payload. So it was really a, a, a huge, uh, change in uh, the ability for, for us to start really seriously exploring the red planet with sophisticated instruments. And uh, so that was a great time. And so a lot of what we know, some of what we know stretched from these earlier rovers, but again, the organic searches and so on really uh, stem from the era of the Curiosity rover. And its goals were uh, for the first time since Viking to assess Mars biological potential as well as to look at the geology of a landing region, study past habitability, and characterize human hazards. And uh, when we think about Mars, uh, going back to uh, looking for life or thinking about life, one of the issues with Mars is that it is an old planet. Uh, when we look at the Earth, the Earth is tectonically active. Many of the surfaces of Earth are uh, geologically young uh, uh, relative to the age of our solar system. And, uh, but Mars is more like uh, the asteroids and, and some of the other uh, objects of the solar system. It's, its surface is generally very ancient. And so the, the, the globe that you see in the top is color coded by the three eras or periods that we have in Mars history. So the one on the left is Noachian. Uh, it was characterized by a uh, valley, uh, valley network and it appeared to have been rather warm and wet, possibly. There was uh, there were all these channels that were uh, made uh, in a lot of sediments. Uh, and so that's the purple part in the Southern hemisphere. And then you had the yellow, which is Hesperian. Um, and then uh, by 2.7 or 2.8 billion years ago, you had the Amazonian. But if you look at the material that was uh, emplaced on the surface of Mars since that 2.6 billion years, it was only the uh, basically some volcanic highlands and a bit of polar area. And so um, if it's, uh, it's almost like going back in time, billions of years by, by going to the Mars surface. Because if we look at uh, Earth's uh, equivalent history, the, uh, the, area, the era from which most of Mars' uh, surface uh, still exists is the earliest time that life was actually confirmed on the Earth. And so we're really going very, very far back in time, especially biologically on the Earth. And so let's, uh, let's look at that just a little bit. The terrestrial biological timeline, uh, all of the fossils that we know of are all from the very far right side of this diagram. They're just from the last half a billion years. Uh, this is 0 0.5 right here uh, on the, if I can get my mouse over there. Um, and so you can see that arrow that says first familiar fossils. And so all of this time before that, we don't see any fossils and people have always wondered what was happening before the Cambrian explosion. And it's because uh, there really existed essentially organisms that were, were mostly consisting of single celled uh, creatures. And uh, so, and, and in fact, if we look at the Mars uh, time period when Mars was geologically active, uh, that's way back before there was atmospheric oxygen on the earth, before there was photosynthesis, and so only effectively rock-eating bacteria was uh, living on the earth. Um, in fact, I like to show this picture. It's the, it's the, the tree of life on earth and uh, just showing uh, some representation of all the species. And we have to go back to extremely primitive material uh, uh, organisms to go back in time that far uh, on, on the earth's uh, equivalent uh, uh, organisms. Um, 
And so if we, here's another diagram that's, that's, that's kind of helpful, and that is microbial metabolism. How do microbes get their energy? And so we have different ways. Of course, we as humans get our energy from other living things. We don't, uh, we don't have uh, photosynthesis ourselves, but most of the plants here are photoautotrophs, right, on the left-hand side, including things like algae. And algae or cyanobacteria is one of the most primitive uh, forms of life that we have in abundance on the earth that we see regularly now. Uh, and that stems back from uh, around the time of the, what's called the great oxygenation event, where the Earth's atmosphere first started to get oxygen. And that's, uh, if you think about a hint, uh, looking at the Earth from space, that there's life on Earth, it is the disequilibrium of the atmosphere, the fact that we have oxygen, as well as uh, carbon dioxide and, and other things, oxidation, as well as reduced species. And, uh, and so there, the, that was the photosynthesis. So before that time, we had chemoautotrophs. That means that we had things that got their energy uh, uh, not from the sun, but from basically uh, making chemical reactions happen in, in the rock surfaces. Basically, th these are rock-eating bacteria. And a few years ago, there was a, an important paper that suggests that the, uh, cyan the precursors of cyanobacteria, the very first pho photosynthetic uh, creatures on the earth, uh, actually had uh, used manganese as part of their, uh, their fixing mechanism. And so they're probably related to some manganese uh, rock-eating bacteria that existed before them. And so that's kind of a hint for maybe something that we could look, look for on Mars. Um, and uh, another thing is that if we, you know, if we want to look at cousins of early life on Earth, we can find that in hot springs and deep sea vents. <clears throat> if we want to actually find fossils of the single-celled organism stemming from that time, we don't actually see them. Uh, the earliest uh, material that we can actually see that looks like organisms is about 2 billion years old. Before that, the stuff just didn't, didn't seem to have, uh, have, have stuck around or, or uh, survived. Uh, remember that the Earth has uh, tectonic action and it has metamorphism as well. So if you have material that's actually survived near the surface of the Earth, a lot of times it's been not just on the surface, but somewhat below the surface, and it's been metamorphosed, heated up and cooked. And so we just, uh, it, that, uh, and the organic material, of course, if you get that above 170 degrees C or something around there, it doesn't stay in its same, same form. And so we'll find kerogen in some of these early life forms, but not actual, uh, or, or we'll find carbon, but not actual uh, organic uh, forms or molecules. But what we do find from the ancient earth are, are um, actual structures that the uh, organisms made. And so the, the one that we find in abundance that we still find actually happening today are stromatolites. And so there are organisms that will uh, create um, stickiness, microbial mats. And that sticky property is something that caused sediments to not lie flat on lake beds and so on, but rather to, to uh, uh, actually to poke up in domes and, um, and, and, and cones. And so we'll find these domical or conical shapes in some of the very ancient rocks. And that is the evidence that we have of some of the most ancient life on earth. And I actually had the privilege uh, at this time last year to be in the Northwest Australian uh, area called the Pil Pilbara and actually see some of these firsthand. Um, and that's the, probably the place where they are preserved the best on, on all of the earth. And the idea was that uh, a few of us should go there so that we would know what we were looking for on Mars. So uh, we'll see if we find anything like that. Um, another idea for, uh, for Martian life would be if we could possibly find biominerals, uh, organic molecules, or isotope ratios that would tell us something about that. And then on the right, you can see these stromatolites on the top part is the ancient stromatolites and modern stromatolites that are still alive uh, or still being produced in, uh, in a wet environment are, are actually down in this lower picture here. So, um, when we think about as well, this is another uh, kind of idea that maybe we can find things that are sort of doubtful, but sort of hinting at this life. And so that would be these biofabrics that we've just talked about, these stromatolites. Um, but more uh, significant is if we could actually uh, measure chirality of, say, uh, amino acids or something like that on Mars. As uh, many of you know, that uh, all of the, uh, all of the uh, 
amino acids that we have that are produced on Earth from living organisms are, have a single-handedness, not their mirror image. And so that uh, is based on the fact that, that life makes copies. And uh, so there's that. But we haven't gotten to that level of sophistication on Mars, and I'll just tell you where we're at, of course. Uh, so the instrument that has actually done sort of the, uh, the most of the work of the last eight years on Mars is got a really simple uh, name called SAM, Sample Analysis on Mars. Uh, they didn't get creative with the name, but it's this 40 kilogram uh, piece of equipment that combines a large laboratory into this uh, small package. It has uh, umpteen valves in there. It has a vacuum pump. It has uh, a, a gas chromatograph with a number of, of uh, GC columns that you can see in the lower right there. Uh, and uh, these are micro, uh, na or, uh, yeah, micro columns. It has a quadrupole mass spectrometer and a, tu a tunable laser spectrometer as well. And so this is the instrument that does organic molecules, it studies atmospheric gases and chemical compounds and isotope ratio. So I'll refer to its results as we go through this talk a little bit. And then I have to tell you about my favorite instrument on uh, the uh, Curiosity rover as well, which is ChemCam. That's the one that we uh, sort of invented. And I led the proposal for this way back in 2004. NASA liked it and said, this is a great idea for studying chemistry around the rover. And so it got selected. So it's an idea where we take a pulsed laser uh, and that, uh, that laser pulse has the instantaneous uh, power to, uh, to light a million light bulbs, but it's only four nanoseconds long, so it doesn't take much overall energy from the rover. And uh, we focus that down to a spot the size of a pinhead. It actually creates a plasma with all that energy, uh, ablating material off of rocks or soils on Mars. And then we look at that plasma with a spectrograph, uh, and a, t a telescope and a spectrograph, and we get the atomic emission spectrum of the material that we just uh, ablated. And so that's uh, how ChemCam works. It's a technique called LIBS. And uh, so I think I have a small video here if it works on your Zoom. So first of all, this part is just an animation showing it's a point focus and shoot technique. And then you'll see the two parts of the instrument. So this is a spectrometer part. It's a sensing part. It has electronics down here. And then spectrometers, they get their light. Actually, this sits in the body of the rover. And we get our light from a long optical fiber from the mast. Here's the mast unit. The laser is on the left, that cylinder. And then this is the telescope that projects the laser light, and then it collects the light that we get back from, uh, from the target. And so we're doing a little demonstration here in Los Alamos uh, for you. And we're going to shoot at a nice big iron pyrite target a few meters away. And you'll see, you won't see the laser beam because it is invisible to our eyes, but you'll see the little flashes of plasma. And there you go. And we'll do it one more time here. And so you can see that this is visibly bright. And so we can do this out to about 25 feet away from the rover. And uh, so we've done that. We've actually made over 800,000 laser shots, 800,000 spectra on Mars, and done a lot of chemistry. Um, this is a time-lapse uh, video that we made with a camera that actually sees through the ChemCam telescope. And we, we took a picture after every laser shot and did about 100 laser shots into a soil on Mars. Um, we do it long enough after the laser shot that you don't see the plasma. In this. You're just seeing the effect of that laser beam making a small hole in the, in the soil on a, on a little bit of a slope. And so you can see the uh, soil falling back into the hole, and you can see the material that's, that uh, spirals or that uh, shoots out of the hole landing down, down, uh, down slope from that hole. And it turns out we use this to discover that Mars soil actually has water in it. It's fairly hydrated. It's in fact as, as uh, rich in water as say a soil in Southern New Mexico in, in the summertime, which isn't bad. It's about two to three to eight percent water, which is uh, like I said, really good for a planet that has a very thin atmosphere, only 1% as thick as the Earth's and, uh, and, and uh, seems to be desiccated otherwise. So something in the soil has really tenaciously held on to water. Um, and uh, so part of our goal with this rover was to determine uh, if Mars really was habitable back in time. Remember, there were people that thought that water never, never survived long on the surface of Mars. So we went to one of the lowest places in 
uh, this part of Mars. It's, it was called Gale Crater. And uh, we went into the into this uh, low area of the crater that's indicated by the red uh, area down here and the stars where we landed. But before we landed, we knew that there was a, a valley and a channel that had gone down there. Now, So the blue is just colored in to show you the low parts of the contour, locally low of the contour map. And then there, there was a, a debris area down at the bottom that we could see from the satellite images. And so we knew we were going someplace that might have been a lake and certainly looked like it had much, uh, water that once flowed into it. But like I said, there were a lot of skeptics. So we'll, we're going to see what we found. Well, we started along and we started to find conglomerates. And for any of you geologists, uh, you know that conglomerates are rocks that are um, basically river rocks that end up getting cemented together on the bank of a river based on uh, some saturation of silica or whatever else it is that then precipitates between the rocks and just starts to cement them together. And you know that because there are a whole bunch of colors of rocks, rounded rocks that are all stuck together. Normally, if you have an uh, original out, uh, rock outcrop, they would all look the same. So you, and I like this one in particular because it has this nice feldspar-rich clasp right in the middle. Um, but it's great. And we started seeing these things all over and showing that there had been rivers flowing there on Mars for, uh, for long periods of time, long enough to round the rocks and long enough to make these conglomerates. We also saw center dipping uh, sandstone beds, uh, center dipping towards the center of the crater. And uh, you can see that these rocks actually have quite a bit of layering here, some coarse grained layers, some fine grained layers. And that's exactly what you would expect to find in a delta uh, area, river delta, kind of below the level of water. Uh, so if you were to go look at the Mississippi River Delta, it's creating this right now uh, down in the, in the Gulf. And uh, so um, this and the uh, conglomerate started to put us into a picture where we found, uh, first of all, the, uh, the river material, then we found the deltaic deposits, uh, and we went about five miles over that. And then we started finding lake deposits. And these lake deposits, were uh, we, we started driving onto a hill or a, a, a slope where these lake deposits had long afterward been eroded down and we could actually drive up and sort of count these lake deposits, figuratively counting them. And we went up over a thousand feet. So you can imagine as this lake was filling in, you would have all of these different layers that would be deposited one year after another. And so uh, counting that all together, we had you know, something on the order of a million layers, suggesting a million years uh, for sort of a uh, minimal time scale for this lake, um, assuming one year for each, for each layer. And it uh, could have been a lot longer if the lake was a little bit intermittent and so on. We still haven't actually gotten to the top of this lake uh, deposits in, in the eight years that we've been roving with this rover and we're still going. Um, and so we, we sent this picture to the public just to say this was a very large lake. It's uh, 90 miles diameter, basically, this crater, and, uh, and that this was open water for a very long period of time, actually, with rivers going into it. So let's get back to the organics and uh, the idea of whether there's, there was life on Mars. So the SAM instrument, uh, a little bit of this is a little complicated, but uh, the total organic carbon that was released uh, at a temperature more than 500 C, this is by the oven in the instrument, is only about 10 to 90 uh, parts per billion of carbon. And uh, there, are, uh, there are meteorites that hit the Earth and Mars that have organic material in them. And this could be consistent with those inputs. Um, now, the SAM uh, instrument also, of course, uh, heats at lower temperatures. And the amount of CO2 that's released at lower temperatures is uh, actually up to several tenths of a weight percent carbon. And uh, we don't know the source of this CO2, but if it, it could possibly have been uh, organic material that was oxidized in the oven of the instrument. In other words, the very thing you're trying to measure the instrument is de destroying is it's trying to volatilize your material to get it so you can measure it in your mass spectrometers. You, you can't do anything about it once your instrument's on Mars. Fortunately, actually, the SAM instrument has some other ways to look at, at organic materials. And that is with uh, what's called derivatization experiments, where you actually flow a solution into the material and, uh, and try to convert some of your uh, not very volatile materials into more 
volatile compounds that we can then measure easier. And those, those experiments have actually been uh, more promising. So we've started to see large organic molecules being released. And that includes uh, 10 chain carbons and, and even more. Um, and uh, so we found those from within four centimeters of the surface of Mars. That's actually fairly surprising because the surface of Mars is pummeled by radiation. And we know that, that uh, organic materials are quite sensitive to radiation. And uh, so part of the idea on Mars is that if we were to be able to go much, uh, say, a few meters underground, we might be able to really find organics that are un, uh, undisturbed by radiation that might be much larger, uh, much uh, heavier mass organic uh, molecules. Mm -hmm. So Sam also looks at, at methane. Methane's been a real enigma around Mars. Um, there's a, a TGO, stands for Trace Gas Orbiter. It's a European satellite around Mars that's been studying, specifically looking for methane, and it doesn't see any. Well, the, uh, the rover has seen some, and they have, it has a seasonal variation to it. And so um, there are a lot of uh, people that are scratching their heads and trying to understand why it is that right on the ground, you seem to be able to uh, sense methane, but getting from orbit, you don't. And so they're really trying to address the atmospheric chemistry to try to, try to understand what's going on to help us uh, understand that. The fact is there, there seems to be a bit of methane uh, released from the rocks or maybe from underground on Mars. There could be uh, an abiotic way that that is created through a process called serpent serpentization of certain, it's a rock uh, um, chemical process, or it could be biotic, so we don't know. Um, so that leaves us with, uh, with a lot of uh, tantalizing details, but nothing completely, uh, uh, no, no silver bullets. So uh, another aspect of this is sort of more circumstantial, and that is that when we started uh, looking into Gale Crater, we started seeing uh, uh, the oxidation state of the rocks is very much in disequilibrium. And so we will have magnetite in, you know, right there with hematite, and those are two uh, different oxidation states of, uh, of iron and different minerals and uh, in, in ways that they shouldn't be together. So it's suggesting that you have quite a bit of disequilibrium there, which uh, of course, in some situations would, would suggest that there had been life, but there's other ways to explain these things as well, of course. Um, but uh, I, I uh, published a paper on some of the really strange uh, spherules. This one on the left is, uh, is, is almost on the size of a soccer ball sitting in the sediments of Mars. We hypothesized that it was due to a redox uh, reaction that was then spreading through the wet sediments uh, because we do have terrestrial analogs from the Navajo formation in, Western, in the Western US. Um, but there's other things there. We had some really strange, uh, uh, very interesting shapes that we've seen. Um, and uh, so um, in fact, some of these here we see, uh, uh, we see iron oxide that seems to have been co-precipitated with uh, calcium uh, uh, sulfates right in this upper picture here. We saw these strange kind of stick-like figures that are also uh, iron oxide as well. So very strange uh, things happening with the oxidation of uh, uh, from, from groundwater on Mars actually. And in fact in one place not just iron but we saw uh, um, manganese that was, uh, that was deposited on a very flat rock. And so what we think is, has happened here is that, uh, that uh, manganese was in solution in groundwater and that the, it, hit, it hit an oxidation front and uh, manganese will precipitate out if there's a lot of oxygen. And so we actually shot through this with the laser on uh, ChemCam, one of the other chemistry instruments. This layer was so thin that, they, that it actually just saw right through it. Uh, it's uh, only a few tens of microns thick. And so this, uh, this was also extremely interesting. There's a lot of people, a bunch of people that study manganese deposits in the early Earth. Um, it's a very interesting subject. Um, but structures, uh, we did not see any stromatolite structures on Mars so far. And in fact, carbon abundances are quite low in the rocks. And, uh, so uh, that's uh, um, sort of a, a, an interesting absence there. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit now. And we're going to talk about the Perseverance rover. And you'll see that, um, and so this is the rover that was actually announced back in 2012 after the landing of Curiosity, that NASA would pursue another rover. Uh, and uh, 
but Perseverance uh, has just launched this year. Uh, its goals are uh, in some senses similar to Curiosity. It's going to explore a different area for geology, ancient habitability, seek signs of ancient life. We have different instruments on it. Uh, but then there's two of these goals right at the bottom that are very different. One is gather samples that could be returned to Earth by a future mission. And another is to demonstrate technology for future human or robotic exploration. <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you in the rest of this talk a little bit about perseverance and what we're going to be doing over the next several years. Um, so uh, just a caricature of the two rovers shows you that they look uh, very similar. Um, uh, on the outside, uh, they, they hold different instruments, and so we were able to do different studies than we were able to on Curiosity. Unfortunately, we don't have anything equivalent to the SAM instrument, but we have different ways to look for uh, organic molecules, as I'll show you in a minute. <clears throat> and then the big thing on, uh, on uh, Perseverance is that it's collecting samples that we hope to bring back to Earth uh, at some time in the future. So that's what we're going to show. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm kind of proud of this. This is the cover of our uh, proposal for that uh, rover. And so we submitted this in 2014. Uh, we wanted to uh, basically show that we were going to do a ChemCam instrument on steroids. And so what we did is we were able to pack um, two or uh, three different techniques into the same size instrument as we have on the Curiosity rover uh, without actually adding any more mass or any, taking up any more space on the rover. And uh, so that was uh, thanks to some really great technical teams that we have both uh, here in Los Alamos and in France, which a uh, uh, country that we partnered with for this. And so we've added a remote Raman and time-resolved fluorescence and invisible and infrared spectroscopy as well. So I'm gonna unpack a little bit of that for you in a few minutes, and I see we're getting close to being out of time. So uh, SuperCam does the same LIBS technique, uh, and you see that on the left with that flash that you already saw. But we, we then take a frequency doubler and make a green laser beam, and we do green laser Raman spectroscopy. And you can see that with that, huge, with that blinding green flash. Uh, and uh, so uh, we do Raman spectroscopy, and we do this uh, infrared spectroscopy. Those are both mineral techniques. And uh, then my French colleagues had the gall to uh, try to add something else. And so we've added a microphone onto, uh, onto uh, uh, SuperCam and I'll, uh, we can actually listen to the sounds on Mars as well. And that has some pretty good scientific applications that I, if you can ask me about later. So we also got involved in an instrument called Sherlock, and uh, that uh, has the coolest acronym, and it also has the nicest picture because you can see Sherlock's shadow with his pipe and, his, and uh, then his magnifying glass. And his magnifying glass is showing a clue, just like the detective, and uh, that clue is organic molecules. And we built part of Sherlock here at Los Alamos, and then the rest of it was at JPL and uh, at a uh, laser lab uh, in the Los Angeles area and, uh, and an imaging lab down in San Diego. And so the Sherlock instrument is really the instrument to look for organic materials, although SuperCam has some of that uh, capability as well with its green laser. And so this is a, uh, another Raman spectroscopy and fluorescence instrument. Uh, it, uh, it, it uses ultraviolet laser and there it has an imager that uh, looks uh, very closely at the uh, surface. Uh, and so the, the wavelength band is shown in the lower left or the lower part of this. The Raman spectra are shown in the very far UV and then uh, fluorescence is shown at longer wavelengths. One of the problems that Raman spectroscopy sometimes has is separation of it from fluorescence, which is a lot brighter signal. But by going very far into the ultraviolet, they can actually separate that easily. We do it with SuperCam by separating it time-wise, and we have a, a, an intensifier that is time-gated with a resolution of 10 nanoseconds. Uh, but you can see some of the detection of, of uh, Sherlock is in subparts per million uh, for some of the organics. And so we're really uh, excited about that. It has very small spatial revol resolution. It's going to be looking at very small spots. And so here's a little bit of some of the uh, spectra that have been taken on the ground of different organics to show what we hope to possibly find on Mars. And so uh, we will see in time. Um, and so actually applying this to something like a stromatolite, which we talked about earlier, uh, the Sherlock instrument actually took some, uh, some mapping uh, images and, 
And there's also an, an uh, instrument called Pixel that's on the arm of the rover as well, and that'll show elemental composition. And the idea is if we find the right place with some of these uh, um, materials, and if there are organics, we can also characterize the chemistry around it. Um, then looking at uh, human uh, resource utilization and human spaceflight eventually, uh, there is a tech demo uh, of uh, an oxygen pr production box, and that's called Moxie, and it'll produce about one quarter of the, the needs of one human uh, while it's uh, operating, and it has a catalyst bed that operates at 800 degrees C, and it's uh, something like that. Uh, is, it's uh, it's going to give a demonstration that we'll, we can produce oxygen out of the CO2 in Mars atmosphere, but it would have to be scaled up a lot, of course, for a human mission but it's gonna be cool to see that working. Then something that everybody's interested in is the helicopter that JPL uh, built as a tech demo. And uh, so this is something that weighs uh, basically under five pounds. It has a, a blade span of uh, almost four feet, almost 1.2 meters. And uh, so it's just, uh, but it has to have these huge blades because the Mars atmosphere is only 1% as thick as the Earth's. And so the idea is that this thing is supposed to fly several times in the first month after landing. And then uh, supposedly its mission will be done and the rover will go on and do its stuff. Uh, I have a hard time seeing this uh, helicopter die unless it really has an accident. So we'll see what happens. I think all bets are off. We'll see what happens. Um, so looking at the landing sites, uh, Perseverance is gonna go to a, a location about 17 degrees north of the equator uh, in the, uh, off to the side of Syracuse Major. Major. This picture always looks upside down, back from my uh, uh, times when I used to sketch uh, Mars looking through a telescope. Uh, but we're going to Jezero Crater. It's a much smaller crater than, uh, than Gale Crater, but it has a deltaic feature again. And uh, so this delta, when it's imaged uh, with uh, spectra from orbit, you can see that it has a lot of purple in that delta, and that's a clay mineral called smectite. And so we're looking forward to studying that. We're gonna look also at this uh, yellow part, that's carbonate. And carbonates are quite rare on Mars from what we've uh, seen so far. And that's one, something we don't understand. Why with a carbon dioxide atmosphere and water that was open with open lakes on the surface of Mars, why did we have not very much carbonates on Mars? We have a lot on the earth. And so that's one of the enigmas that I think we need to understand this is almost uh, in, a, in the form of a bathtub ring around the uh, perimeter of this crater. And so we'll, we'll really want to see how this carbonate formed. And uh, so there's a, a number of things that we're going to do in this crater as we go to explore it. Now, a lot of the attention of this rover is going to be on uh, getting samples. And it's going to get samples by drilling and uh, with a hollow drill and so that we have drill cores. That way we get samples from the surface of the rock, but also from inside of the rock. And so uh, this uh, drill is, I've got a real short uh, video that shows because there's a lot of mechanisms. Hopefully this works through Zoom. And this drill core gets brought back onto the rover. There is a uh, whole system called the SCS, the sample caching system. It starts with this turret that brings the core with uh, encapsulated in a titanium tube down into this whole area. There's a second arm down there that then brings it to image the, the top, seal it, and then put it in storage. And it doesn't actually show all of those steps in this short video, but then it puts it in storage over on the left there. And then eventually those, whoops, those cores will be dropped onto the surface of Mars. And uh, it's gonna be left there for a future mission to bring it back to Earth. And uh, so that mission is starting to get funding um, at, at JPL and other places to start to define that mission. And it's, um, so first of all, here are 38 tubes that were being installed into the rover. This was, if you see the date on the left-hand side, this was in May of this year uh, at the height of COVID. This was in Florida. And this was one of the last things that got installed into the rover. Uh, ultra sterile tubes so that we didn't bring any organism, organisms from Earth to Mars and think we found something uh, when we get these back. Um, and in fact, this is the belly of the rover. And I think the capsule is, the top part of the capsule is already on top of this rover. This is a wheel already folded up. The helicopter is already stuck there on the, on the belly of the rover with the cover on it. 
And so it's all ready to go. And so this was just weeks from the launch. Now the, the caching strategy is one where we can drop those uh, tubes individually. And so we'll probably drill a few, drop a few, and then maybe go to a more uh, risky place. Uh, but if we were to get the rover stuck somewhere without dropping those samples, uh, we, another mission could not really come by and get them out very easily. So we have to get them out of this rover and onto the ground. And so we do, we'll, we'll do that maybe a couple of places. Stay tuned for how that works. And then uh, there has to be two other missions that will happen. One with a Mars ascent vehicle, it's shown in the center here, uh, because of the lower gravity of Mars, it's only 38% of that of Earth, reduced atmosphere, a rocket about the, something that would fit in the room you're sitting in would uh, really actually below the ceiling would, would get this into low Mars orbit. And so we're, uh, we need a way to get the samples into the cone of that rocket, get it um, mounted up and launched, and then, uh, then it could go into low Mars orbit. There it would rendezvous with another mission that would ferry it back to the Earth with a capsule that would help it to get back through the atmosphere of the Earth and onto the ground. And so those other two missions are in the uh, um, development stage now, or in the er very early stages now, with hopes that that would happen in the, in the late 2020s. Um, and that's the ultimate goal, in part because uh, really studying organic materials is so challenging. And uh, so we think that it would work so much better we get these sam if we get the best samples back on Earth. Um, now, uh, we've got uh, at Los Alamos where I'm working and other places, we've got uh, ideas that we would really like to explore uh, for other places in the solar system. Uh, this envisions a lander on Jupiter's moon Europa. And uh, so that was at one point uh, hot to start developing. Well, that's been pushed back a fair amount now. Um, and uh, so we started working on an instrument that would follow for, from ChemCam and SuperCam, and we're gonna call it Organicam. And so Organicam was going to be really looking for organic materials in an imaging mode. And we can do that using this fluorescence, this time-resolved fluorescence that the Sherlock and SuperCam instrument use. But instead of a small spot mode, we would use it in a broadband mode. And so we started developing this instrument. There's the uh, sort of the drawings of it on the bottom and the realized version of it on the top. And so we've got a prototype of that now that we're just starting to get in the lab to uh, look at. So it's, it's great to uh, not only be uh, involved in current missions, but think about the future. And so we've had a lot of fun with that. But uh, for now, oh, and I've got one or two more pictures on that. Um, if we could make that thing lightweight enough, we would love to put it on, a, on another helicopter on Mars and go to lava tube caves on Mars. And some of those uh, lava tubes have skylight openings and that would, uh, a helicopter would be the best way to get down into one of those places to get underground on Mars and be able to start looking for organic materials down there. So that's uh, also just something that's pretty cool. The caves on Mars, some of them have very large openings and you can see them from orbit. And so that would be, uh, that would be a sort of a really uh, cool dream in the future. But for right now, um, uh, Perseverance has just launched. Uh, and uh, so it is now about 55 light seconds away from the Earth and uh, should get to Mars on February 18 of next year. And so we're really excited. Uh, we are praying for a safe landing. It's never a, a guaranteed thing. And uh, so hopefully all will go well. Um, I really want to thank you for your attention in this talk. And uh, I think I'll leave it there and we'll take uh, questions after this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roger, for a fascinating talk and some cool equipment too. I'm just picturing the laser equipped helicopters. That's kind of nifty. Um, but yeah, I don't, I didn't see any questions coming up in the chat. If you'd like to, you can put some there. I think we've got few enough people that if you just want to verbally unmute yourself and ask a question, we can do that as well. Uh, any questions? Uh, for I have a question. Dr. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Roger, you mentioned the limitation on the Curiosity rover that the drill can go, I think it was four centimeters down, which is a heavily radiation damaged uh, depth. Can the Perseverance rover drill deeper? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, and uh, so the drill on Perseverance is, does not go deeper. So it was really focused on just getting these drill cores. 
one of the things that we can do to try to avoid radiation is we can try to let geology help us. And so if we can go to a, a scarp in the landscape, um, uh, that scarp was probably being eroded away. And so if we're drilling right next to a scarp or a, a slope, then um, potentially that would have gotten much less radiation uh, because it would have been exposed right near the surface for much shorter than a real flat surface. So that's one thing. Also, um, the Europeans are convinced that we really should go deeper. And so they've put their money with that idea. And so the ExoMars rover that was supposed to launch this year, but has now been delayed to 2022, uh, it has a drill that should go down two meters deep. And they also have a Raman spectrometer to uh, analyze what comes up from two meters down. So uh, there are those two, uh, those two things. But you're right that uh, Perseverance is not trying to drill deep. Great question. Uh, any, any other questions for, for Roger? And maybe you can just uh, briefly give your name before you state your question. Jonathan Regenmorter here. Um, these lava tubes you're talking about, do you have any idea their age? Uh, yeah, we generally do. Um, so uh, the way we estimate ages of uh, the surface on Mars is by looking at the density of craters. And that's a, uh, a well-known way of doing it from the moon as well as, uh, as, well as on, on Mars and other planets. Uh, it, of course, uh, that gives you a relative age. It doesn't give you a very accurate age at all, nothing like some of the radiometric dating techniques. But um, if you look at the relative uh, numbers of craters uh, and also uh, sort of the general geology, a lot of the lava tube caves are in more recent terrain in some of the uh, highlands surrounding some of the large volcanoes. Mars doesn't have plate tectonics, and so it has these volcanoes that keep building and building and building on top of themselves, going 27, 28 kilometers high, many kilometers higher than Earth's uh, 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 volcanic edi edi edifices, because we have the Hawaiian island chains that actually move along and create new islands. But anyway, so some of the, some of the lava tube caves are really in that area. Um, I've, I've had a student this last year who was actually studying uh, the locations of some of these uh, lava tube caves to look for uh, older and less recent caves because I think if you want to look for uh, back to where when Mars was more habitable you'd want to have an older cave and we did find a, a several and so uh, we think that there's some good candidates to go in some much more ancient terrain on Mars as well and uh, so that's something that we'll be spending more time looking into. Yeah, that was kind of my question, as if uh, you had caves that were of the right age. That was yeah. Of course, as you, know, as you get to older and older terrains, you can imagine that over time, a cave is, is more likely to collapse in on itself. Um, although there's not a lot of seismicity on Mars, uh, apparently, so that's, uh, that's also things tend to last a long time, including caves. Also, this is the first time I've heard of caves on Mars. I now want to go spelunking on Mars. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe you can briefly, uh, here's one quick question, if you can briefly say, what, what's the Canadian contribution? Canada was, um, is listed here as one of the sources of the scientific instruments, and we have several Canadians here tonight, so what, what was the Canadian contribution uh, to the instrumentation? I should move my, uh, my images here so that I can actually read my own slide. Um, or is it and, part of the uh, supercam? Yes. <laughs> Uh, so uh, we have several collaborators uh, on SuperCam, uh, one in uh, Saskatchewan, I'm sorry, one at, uh, kind of blank on this right now, but one at McGill University and then uh, one at University of Winnipeg. And uh, I believe there's another one, and I'm probably blanking on it now, but uh, they are uh, collaborators on our SuperCam science team. And in fact, Ed Clutis in uh, Winnipeg helped us with some of the calibration targets that are on the back of the rover for our instrument. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Any, any other questions for Roger, for Dr. Weens uh, in the chat room or, oh, there's a question here. Two in the chat room. Yeah, so from Emma, or no, SD, uh, was Mars always irradiated or is it speculated to have been radiation free before? A question from SD. Oh yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. 
Um, so radiation comes from deep in space. Uh, we call it cosmic rays or galactic cosmic rays. And then there is some radiation from the sun. The sun actually creates energetic particles as well. And uh, so all of space is bathed in this uh, radiation. It's why the human uh, component of, of, uh, of NASA has a bit of a problem when they, uh, when they want to send humans into deep space. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the uh, energetic solar events when the solar max comes around 2024, 2025 uh, can actually kill, uh, is enough to kill an astro uh, astronaut. Um, oh. But uh, so you need an atmosphere and you effectively ideally need a magnetic shield around it. And Earth has, uh, Earth has both of them. And so that's very effective, or generally quite effective, although here at 7,000 feet elevation where I'm standing, we get, we get more cosmic rays than you do down in Michigan. Um, but uh, uh, we, we need to be protected from those things. And uh, Mars has almost neither a magnetic shield nor an atmosphere. It only has 1% as thick an atmosphere as the Earth. And uh, so there is uh, there's this radiation now. So the question then was, uh, what, was Mars always, did Mars always have a radiation on its surface? And that's going to depend on whether it had a magnetic field at one point. It seems like it probably had somewhat of a magnetic field, but it was way back in time, about 4.2 billion years ago, and it may have disappeared about that time. Uh, and then the atmosphere of Mars, we're still trying to really understand it. And it has to do with uh, this whole issue with lakes and other things on Mars. Um, but it seems like we probably had to have uh, several hundred millibars, maybe almost half the atmosphere that we have at sea level on Earth in order to get the climate that we had on Mars at some points in time, considering that Mars is quite a bit farther from the sun than the Earth. And so that thicker atmosphere would certainly have shielded the surface from most of the radiation um, that it's getting now. So, uh, so way back in time, no. And so it would have been a more habitable po uh, place from the aspect of radiation, as well as you know, temperature and atmosphere and so on. Good question. All right, we'll take two or maybe at most three more questions uh, before we go to our breakout. But here's an interesting question. Um, what about the microphone, Emma asks? Um, it would be neat to listen to Mars, and, uh, but what are some of the scientific benefits of using the microphone? Yeah, um, so, well, we've, First of all, we wanted to do it as, an, as a student experiment and sort of a gee whiz thing. And, uh, but there was no place for that in the proposal, actually. It, you know, everything in the proposal had to be scientific. And uh, so then we tried to get it, sneak it back on after the instrument was selected. And NASA said, no, it has to have a scientific justification. And uh, again, thanks to our French colleagues, they got a student involved and he started looking at uh, some aspects. Now it turns out when we do these laser shots, um, when the plasma is created, it's a supersonic plasma. And if you know something about supersonic events, they tend to make a small noise, uh, like, uh, like supersonic planes or lightning actually is supersonic as well and creates that thunder. Um, and uh, so anyway, each time you zap a rock, you actually make a zapping sound with that laser, with the plasma. And uh, it turns out that if we listen to that zapping sound of a rock, uh, of the laser creating the plasma of the rock. Um, if it's a soft rock, it's going to start to burrow into the rock and the sound is going to decrease. It's going to change. If it's a hard rock, it's not really going to change. And so uh, by actually listening to a series of laser shots in one spot on the rock, we can actually determine without ever driving up to the rock whether that rock is hard or soft. Uh, we're still working on that, but that's one of the properties. Another is if it has a surface coating on it, it's going to sound different as you tunnel through that surface coating. And uh, so there's, there's a bunch of things like that. There's also wind effects and things like uh, associated with atmospheric effects that we're expecting to study with, uh, with the rover. Now, if you, uh, since you asked, I think I have a, you know what, I have a recording of it, but I believe I tried it once and I could actually not hear it through Zoom. So um, I don't think I can actually do it um, in my backup slides. So actually, sorry about that. I, I don't think I can do it for you. But the sounds on Mars uh, actually really attenuate strongly because of the thin atmosphere and the fact that the CO2 
the speed of sound on Mars is only about two thirds the speed on Earth. Uh, and uh, so we, we take that zapping sound, which almost sounds like a tick, tick, tick on Earth. And on, in a Mars atmosphere, it, it almost sounds like you just tap the tom-tom. Mm -hmm. And so it's pretty cool. Anyway, we'll, uh, we'll get to some recordings from Mars as soon as we get there. Zoom with Mars. Uh, yeah. Okay, one last question we'll, we'll do before we do our breakouts. And um, uh, that comes from Peter. And uh, what things didn't make it uh, onto your rover wish list? What equipment uh, would be the next pieces of equipment that you would have wanted to have uh, bolted onto the rover? Oh, uh, wow, that's a, that's a difficult question. Um, there's different ways I could answer that. Uh, one is uh, maybe what other people proposed that didn't make it. Actually, the helicopter was proposed and it didn't make it. But then uh, NASA officials liked the idea so much that they funded it as a tech demo. But for our instrument, SuperCam, we, uh, uh, we started out um, thinking, well, we should add one mineralogy technique. But then we decided, well, that might not fly. Or there was other, other reasons why we ended up adding so many different things to our instrument. But we, we ended up thinking we were totally crazy to put five different techniques into one instrument. And perhaps I still think we're crazy because we have to deal with the data stream from all of them. Mm -hmm. But um, it was a very ambitious thing and uh, we ended up uh, uh, winning in the end, uh, but that was quite surprising for us. So uh, maybe that doesn't really answer your question, but uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of other kinds of instruments that would be nice to have, uh, but you have a limited uh, thing, amount of, uh, a, a limited purse to actually fund the things. They always cost more than you think. Uh, because things just break and fail, um, and uh, then you have a limited uh, amount of mass you can put on these rovers. So uh, we got what we got. Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Weens. Maybe we can all show our appreciation. Either in the chat room, you can clap. I think there's a little reaction button if you want to uh, clap. And, thank uh, you so much, Roger. This was an amazing talk. I loved it. Yes. Yes, thank you so much. And I see lots of... Uh, clapping and uh, appreciation here. So thank you to everyone who came as well. And um, if, uh, if you have a few more moments, we're thinking for about 15 minutes, we'll, we'd like to break into breakout rooms. Um, and we will do that in groups of around five or so to somewhat emulate the hallway conversations uh, after, after a typical meeting. Yeah, have a good night and uh, take care. Bye-bye. God bless.